say which one of the following is true. So the only way you're going to know about what is true is to read the choices. And when I read the choices, I'm saying, I don't know what's going on here, but it's a comparison of sorts between F, F prime and F double prime. They want me to compare them. And I'm looking at F. So we have F. So they want me to compare F of two, F prime of two, F double prime of two. So I know right away, F of two, that's the graph I have, is zero. So F of two is zero. Next up, F prime of two, that's gonna be the slope of the tangent line here. I don't know what that slope is, but I know that that tangent slope would be negative. And F double prime of two tells me about concavity. So in terms of this actual graph, is it concave up or concave down? Is it a smiley face or is it a sad face? There's your eyes, that's a smiling face. A smiling face would mean concave up. So if that is concave up, that means the second derivative at that spot must be positive. So I don't know exactly what the answers are, but I have enough information now to list them, which is what this is doing. So I'm going to list them from small to big. So the smallest one I have is F prime of two. The middle one is zero and F double prime of two is a positive number. So the correct answer to number one is C. Mark your papers accordingly. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we'll work on getting the score. Any questions on number one? All right. Number Say that again. Try again, I can't hear you. But can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I was gonna say, so for these type of questions, so is it always gonna be like one zero, then one positive, then one negative? Um, good chance. Um, it's possible that you could have one of them given to you in a different order, but typically if you're gonna list three things and you have very little information, odds are good that one of them is zero, one of them's positive, one of them's negative. That's not a guarantee, but I'd say pretty good chance. Okay, thank you. All right, number two, hopefully was a 10 second question. This is your difference quotient. This is my take the derivative of the top right corner. We haven't looked at one of these in a while, but this just says F is equal to sine of X and we want to find f prime of pi over three. So the derivative of sine is cosine and cosine of pi over three, that's at 60 degrees. The cosine at pi over three, again, 60 degrees is one half. And that takes us to letter B. Any questions there, guys? All right, let's take a look at number three. Let f of x be the function defined below. Which of the following statements are true? The limit exists, pause. So just take these one at a time. The limit exists. So what do we know if the limit exists? This better be continuous. So we should plug in 20 to the top and bottom. If I plug in 20 to the top, I get 10 minus three, I get seven. I plug in 20 to the bottom, I get five and two at seven. Okay, so from the left and from the right, they both give me seven. Sounds like letter or number one. Number one, check, good to go. All right, how about two? Functions differentiable at x equals 20. All right, here's the trick to this question. Both of these graphs are linear. If you have two linear functions that slam together, I don't know exactly what these look like. I'm just showing you, here's a line, here's a line. Anytime two linear functions slam together, that's considered a cusp, considered a sharp point, means it's not differentiable. 
So we have two straight lines. Just think about regardless of how not sharp the point might appear, if it's two linear functions meeting at a point, that's considered a cusp. So that would be not differentiable. So number two, that one's no good. Number three, the function's continuous. We already proved it is continuous when I plugged it in for the first part. So it's definitely continuous. It's continuous, the limit is good, but it's not differentiable. So one and three are correct. For number three, the answer was D. Does anybody have any questions on one or two or three? Mr. Baker, um, if, it, if it was like X square, one of them, would it be differentiable? Uh, like no, it needs to be a curve. So like, even if you have, it's gotta be some sort of curve. So like, even if you have like that and then like that so there's your x squared and then it shoots off that's still a cusp so it's got to be something where it's smooth the whole way so. does that make sense if we do if we derive just both of these equations and plug in the, the the value uh and if we get like the same number then the the system is differentiable. Or if you yeah, you can do that. Yeah, if you take the derivative of each and you plug in the value and you get the same, then yes, it is. Okay, thank you. It's just, you can see real quick here, when you take these derivatives, you're gonna get one half and one fourth. Yeah, that way that like makes a lot of sense. Yep. Can you sure. explain how it's continuous again? Continuous. So if I plug in 20 to both of these, Think of it this way. Um, I don't. Let's pretend like, like obviously, if you took the time, you could graph this, right? Let's just pretend though. You have no idea what this looks like. So, here's my graph, and we know that everything here is coming together at 20. So I have a graph for things that are less than 20, also known as to the left of the graph, and I have things for greater than 20, which is to the right of the graph. So if they're going to be continuous, just think of it like this. Say, so here's the left graph. I don't know what's happening. 7 to 20. And here's the right graph. I don't know what's happening here either. But it's heading to 20. Once I get to 20, for this thing to be continuous, these two have to meet, right? Because like if this one, if the red one's up here and the black one's down here, then we got to jump in the graph. It's not continuous, right? So if they meet, then it's going to be continuous. So when I plug in 20, to each one of these, if I get the same value, which I do, now I know, okay, what happens? 20 comes in and it's seven. And then we say, well, what happens with red? Oh, red does the same thing. Red comes in, it's also seven. So if they're the same thing, that means they lock into the same spot. That means it's gotta be continuous because now we've locked in. Same thing with why the limit exists. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything else, guys? A, B, C, or one, two, three. Okay, number four. Um, okay, f of x is equal to that, and g is a differentiable function. What's the derivative of this, this, this? All right, so here's the first thing I would do. Uh, since g is a differentiable function, we don't necessarily know what it is, but what does it say over there? We have f of g of x. All right, so what do we know about the derivative of this? It would be f prime g, g prime. All right, so we need to plug g of x into f prime. Well, isn't f prime 2x, right? So f prime is 2x, so f prime of this thing is like plugging g of x into 2x. So that would give me that. And then that would give me that. And then you got yourself an answer. It's just kind of like a blueprint type problem. And that takes us to letter D. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. Wouldn't it be 2x since 
Yeah, yeah, it's two, yeah, yeah. The derivative is two x. I just plugged in g of x into two x. Gotcha. All right. All right, five is an in-depth problem. Lots happening. It says that an object moves in a straight line so that at any time, yada, yada, we have velocity. So I'm just gonna start with that. V at T is equal to two cosine of three T. What is the distance traveled from the object distance traveled by the object from t equals zero to the first time that it stops. From t equals zero to the first time that it stops. Well, what's the first thing I need to do? I need to figure out what's the first time it stops. How do I figure out when something stops? Finding the zeros? Of what? Uh, of time. You almost got it. Find the zeros of what? What am I setting equal to zero? Cosine. Going to be cosine. The velocity function, right? So remember when something changes directions, the velocity is zero, or particles at rest is when velocity is at zero. So the first time this thing stops is going to be when the velocity is zero. So my first step here is to set two cosine of 3t equal to zero, and we solve this trig equation. So how do we solve that trig equation? The trig thing by itself, cosine of 3t is equal to zero. I divided both sides by two. Okay, what are we doing next? We are, well, let me straighten this up. All right, what are we doing next? We cover up the angle and ask where is. Where is cosine equal to zero? Cosine is equal to zero at, pi over two and three pi over two. If we solve these out, I've got pi over six and three pi over six, also known as pi over two. Okay. All right, so what's the first time that this thing stops? The first time this thing stops is pi over six. Okay, now that we know that piece of information, let's read the question again. An object moves along a straight line so that its velocity is whatever. What's the distance traveled from the object by the object from t equals zero to pi over six? Okay, now, how do we find total distance traveled? Somebody. We integrated. The integral of the um, absolute value of the velocity. Bingo, integral of the absolute value of two cosine three T DT from zero to pi over six. Once you got that, you're home free. Well, other than you have to do this. So how do we integrate this now, guys? Substitute. Use substitution. Yeah, for the record, you should totally skip this problem because it's way more than two minutes long. So we got u du dt for this problem. All right, so we're going to go with 3t. We're going to go with 3dt. We're going to go with dt is going to be what? du over 3. All right, so we're going to bring this two out front. So I've got two integral cosine u du over three. So now I just have two thirds out front. We integrate cosine, we get sine. So that's going to be sine of u, which is 3t, from zero to pi over six. And don't forget, we've got a two thirds out front. Okay. All right, what happens now? If we plug in pi over six, this is sine of three pi over six is pi over two minus the sine of zero with two thirds out front. All right, what's that give us? The sine of pi over two is what? 
one. one. One minus zero times two thirds. I'm getting two thirds for an answer, letter C. So there was a lot of things happening there, guys. So the first of which was just figuring out that bound. And then the second one being, okay, now that we know the bound, go do a pretty in-depth U substitution and go from there. Okay. So does anybody have any questions on that? Does that make sense? I just I just um, circled pi over six. So you have to like go. You got to go way further than that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty complicated one, but I mean, sorry, you're not going to get all of these, right? All right, number six, you better number six, you better get right. So, what are we doing on number six? This is just take the derivative and plug in. Does that say four? Is that what that is? It's a little cut off. All right, so if we're going to take the derivative and plug in four, let's rewrite the original. So the original would be x to the half plus three x negative half. So now we're ready to derive. So your derivative would be half x negative half minus three halves x negative three halves. Cleaning that up, one over two x to the half minus three over two x to the three halves. And into that mess, we are plugging in four. So that would be one over, if you put a four, or we put a four in there, the square root of four, right, is two, two times two, we've got a fourth minus three over. You put a four in here, square root of four is two, two to the third is eight, eight times two, we've got 16. Common denominator of that, and you've really got uh, four over 16 minus three over 16. I'm getting one over 16, choice A, final answer. Any questions there? Anybody, anybody six for six? It's easy enough. All right, number seven, a nice implicit problem. Um, hopefully you're doing a product rule with that. Otherwise it would not be a nice implicit problem. So we're trying to find dy dx. Um, that would be first is sine, derive the second, cosine goes to negative sine. So first derive the second plus the second, derive the first, sine goes to cosine, and into that we are plugging in pi over three. Sine of pi over three, that's at 60 degrees, is radical three over two. At root pi over three, we should get in the same thing with a negative sign, and then half, half. Um, all right, we gotta go further. Multiply that out, that's negative three fourths plus one fourth, negative two fourths. Better answer, negative one half choice A. Okay, number eight, air is being pumped into a spherical balloon, yada, yada. Within a second of reading this, you should know it's a related rate. It means I need a formula. The formula is given. So volume is equal to four thirds pi r cubed. Time to derive implicitly. So this is dv dt is equal to four, I'm bringing the three out front, pi r squared dr dt. Now we're just looking to see what they give us. Air is being pumped into the balloon at a rate of eight. 
that sounds like my volume is equal to four pi. Find the rate of change of the radius. So we're finding dr dt when r is four. So just tossing that in and you're almost there. So that's four squared is 16. That makes 64. Eight divided by 64 pi. Answer to this problem is one over eight pi. And that was choice C. Any questions on eight? Okay, we're on to nine. Let's see what we got. Looks like a composite function tells me that h of x is equal to f of g of x. We want a derivative and we want to plug in one. That derivative would be f prime g g prime. And now we're tossing in one. So that's f prime. Let's just look up g of one. g of one is three. g prime of one is negative two. And now we need f prime of three. That appears to be seven times negative two is negative 14. That is choice B as in boy. Okay, number 10. Number 10. All right. F of X is equal to cosine. And now this is the angle e to the 2x. So when we take this derivative, this is a trig derivative. A trig derivative goes trig prime, so negative sign, trig prime, stuff, stuff prime. Stuff prime is 2e to the 2x. So now we're just looking for the one that's equivalent to that. And the one that's equivalent to that is choice e. If I just take this stuff and throw it out front, that's going to be the same thing that they have written there in choice E. Any questions on anything one through 10? Okay, heading down to 11. And boy, we've got a mess here. Average value. Average value requires a formula. This is your one over B minus A. One over B minus A, that's two minus zero times the result of our integral. So I'm just gonna go off to the side because clearly that is a U substitution. So that would be U du dx. So that would be X squared, or I'm sorry, X to the fourth, plus nine, so four x to the third dx. So dx is du over four x to the third. And then we start plugging stuff in. And then after you do that, you're gonna have x to the third u to the half du over four x to the third. From there, you can see hopefully that our x to the thirds are gonna cancel. And we have a four trapped on the bottom. So now I really have one over eight integral zero to two, u to the half du, and you are ready to get going. So now if you integrate that, u to the three halves over three halves, flipping that upstairs becomes two thirds. Bringing in our one eighth, from up above, that makes it 2 24ths. 2 24ths is really a 12th. 
So now trying to simplify some of this, we've got one over 12, u to the three halves from zero to two, and what is u? X to the fourth plus nine. All right, a lot of math in this problem. Plug in two, 16, nine is 25, square root is five, cubed is 125, 125 over 12. Toss in a zero, gives me nine, because it doesn't all go away, right? Nine, square root of nine is three, 27, 27 over 12 gives me an answer of 98 over 12. Sounds great, that's not a choice. We can divide these each by two to get the choice. And that would be 49 over six, choice E. Any questions on that one? Would you recommend just skipping this one because it takes so long and like trying to come back to it? Probably, yeah, not the worst idea. Um, honestly and truly, like I said before, you're trying to get 20 out of 30. I mean, you're trying to get 30 out of 30, but like just realistically speaking, if you get 20 out of 30 and you keep that going and you do reasonable on the free response, you're absolutely going to pass. So yeah, for me, I would make sure that I'm get, giving each question a chance because even if you say you get, if you find 20 questions that you can do quickly, if you just pick the letter C or whatever for the other 10 questions, you're gonna get two or three of them, right? Just by guessing. So if you can find 20 of them that you definitely know, and then you guess two or three of them, right? Now you got 23, right? And you're, you did great. Um, all right, 12. Let's see here in a second. Let me get a piece of paper. Okay, a particle moves along the axis so that the position is given by that thing. Okay, we have position. We want to know what is the value of the velocity when the acceleration is zero? All right, hold on. So let's just try to wrap our head around that. So we have y of t is position, and that's negative 3 t to the fourth plus 18 t squared. All right, so let's just get velocity out there. So that's negative 12 t to the third plus 36 t makes acceleration negative 36 t squared plus 36. Okay. Um, what are they asking here? Let me read this again. What is the value of the velocity? That means like plug something in when the acceleration is zero. So when the acceleration is zero, to me, that means set this equal to zero. And that would give me, if we solve this, negative 36 t squared plus one. This is weird. That doesn't zero out. Uh, what am I doing wrong here, guys? Hold on. If I got a copied right, anytime something crashes on you, always check that we got a copied right. Negative three t to the fourth plus eighteen t squared. Okay, that would make this twelve t to the third negative twelve t to the third plus thirty six t. That would make this negative thirty six t squared plus thirty six. Okay, our math's good. Okay, let's just read this again. Particle moves along the axis, we have position. What's the value of the velocity when the acceleration is zero? Um, what when negative one? For t squared uh, plus one, because negative 36 times negative one would be 36. Or... Hold on, did I screw up? That's what I'm looking for. Hold on. Ne you're saying my derivative is wrong? I'm saying um, the last step. Maybe you should be t squared minus one because negative 36 times negative one would be 36. Yeah, but it would make this negative too. Oh, fine. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't get me out of the mess there. I think I'm just reading this incorrectly or I'm not understanding what they're asking. What is the, 
Sorry, for A of T, doesn't it give you zero if you just plug in one because T squared is one, then you get negative 36 plus 36? Let's see, does that do the trick? Why wouldn't that have solved out though? Or did we not need to do that? I guess I'm trying to figure out why when I factored this, it didn't give me anything. Let's cross this out. All right, so this would be negative 36 T squared. Let's just go with that is equal to negative 36. If we try to solve that, that gives me T squared. Okay, that'll work that way. T squared is equal to one. T is equal to plus or minus one. And going that route, it says very clearly, this is for T greater than zero. So now I think what you just said is actually is correct as well. Um, all right, so then if you come back up to here and we plug in one, that's gonna give us negative 12 and 36. Yeah, there you go right there. Answers E24. It was kind of weird the way they wrote that. It threw me off a little bit. E24. Any questions on that one? Okay, 13, normal line. Normal means perpendicular, perpendicular to the tangent slope. So that means you wanna find the tangent slope and then turn it upside down and change the symbol, take the opposite reciprocal. So for right now, just try to find H prime of one. And once you find H prime of one, turn that upside down and change the symbol. Normal means perpendicular. So H is really equal to that stuff to the half. So if we go to take its derivative, that's gonna be, H prime is gonna be half, keep it, drop it, derive it. Um, that's really 15x squared minus two over two square root of five x to the third minus two x plus one. Into that, they're asking us to plug in one. Works out nicely. That's five, that's three. Another one makes four on the bottom. Square root of four is two. So that gives us a four on the bottom. Gives us a 13 on the top. Okay, so the tangent slope is 13 over four. Means the normal slope is negative four over 13 choice B. Choice B. Any questions? Okay, functions defined above, which of the following statements are true? Which of the following statements are true? Okay, so we've got two functions again up there. We wanna know what's true. So just go through each one of them one at a time, see what we get. So for the first one, the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right. Let's plug in one and see what we get. That would be one up top. And on the bottom, what happens if we plug in one? That's gonna be natural log of one, but natural log of one is equal to zero. So those don't match up. So one, no good. Two, the limit of, now that's the same thing, but these are the derivatives. So you need to take the derivative and plug them in. The derivative of the top one is three. The derivative of the bottom one, how do we take that derivative? That's a natural log derivative. Natural log derivative is stuff prime over stuff. So when I plug in one into the derivative, that's gonna be three over one, which is three. So into the derivatives, I get three for both of them. Number two is good to go. Check out three. It's differentiable at one. Can't be. Limit doesn't exist. Can't be there. It's not continuous. Only one I'm getting is number two. So that would be two only. And two only would be choice C. So for that one, we are at C. Mr. Baker, but when you derive it, they're going to give you like, it's going to give you like the same number. Yeah, that's why, that's why choice two is good. 
Uh, so it, I mean, it's it's not differentiable. Yeah, it shows it's gonna be three over three and three over three x negative two. Uh, yeah. Hold on. So the limit doesn't exist there. So I'm talking about the actual function. So if we were to look at this, remember the phrase, if it's differentiable, it's continuous. If it's continuous, I can't promise you it's differentiable. So DC, not CD. So it's definitely differentiable. If it's, if it's, if it's definitely differentiable, it's continuous. So if we look at that first one, the limit doesn't exist. So if the limits don't exist, let's think about what that means. At uh, what, one? So at one, coming from the right, the answer is one. So I don't know what happens. Coming from the right, the answer is one. Coming from the left, the answer is zero. So I don't, obviously that graph isn't perfect, but when I'm approaching one from each direction, on the one from the right, it gave me one. On the one from the left, it gave me zero. Those don't match up. So there's no way that I could take the derivative at one when you have that gap there. It's an undefined spot. Yeah, because when you take the derivative of top, top and the bottom and plug in one, it's going to give you the same number. That's right. Kind of like yeah, so I think we just found, I think we just proved to ourselves that that doesn't guarantee you that it's going to be differential. Okay, yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, 15. Okay, nice and easy one. So, what are we doing for 15? We are taking a derivative. We're doing a tangent line problem. So, tangent line problem means make a box, we need a point. We need a slope. Okay, so if I plug in zero, that's e to the zero plus zero. e to the zero is one plus zero is still one. Now we need a derivative. e to the stuff times stuff prime is my derivative plus one because that's the derivative of x. So there's our derivative and we're gonna plug in zero. So that's e sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. So e to the zero is one, one times one is one, one plus one is two. So as far as my box goes, I've got zero, one, two. So that's y minus one is equal to two, x minus zero. It's good for me if you're taking my tests. This one has them all solved out for y, so you should do the same. That gives you y is equal to 2x plus 1. And that is choice A. All right. So I would like you guys to just briefly, we're going to stop there for tonight. 15 questions is good for our first night back. Um, just briefly sum up your scores for me. And just in a private message on chat, click on my name and I'm not judging you one way or the other, guys. I just want to see where we're at. Uh, tell me what you got for a score out of 15 so far. Um, honestly, you can tell me any number you want. I did totally fine. I just want to see where we're at. So I'm going to pause for a second as I'm reading these. So regardless of what you're getting for a score, um, important thing is, does it make sense when you're reading it or watching you do them now? So you even seen when I did it, I had a hiccup on one of them. I wasn't sure what they were asking. You're not going to get a perfect score for the most part. It's just if you have an idea on each one, kind of limit the mistakes. And then as you start to watch these mock exams, which is what we're going to be mainly doing over the next you know, four or five weeks, the day I'll start to click and then you can apply it when you take the test. Okay. All right, guys, does anybody have any questions? All right, tomorrow night, we will be going over 16 through 30. So tune in then.
Uh, and then next week, uh, we're going to spend a good amount of time doing that calculator section. And we're going to kind of breeze through the FRQs because I don't think those ones were too hard in comparison to the ones I had been giving you. So I think those ones were pretty easy. Uh, but I do want to make sure we get through all 30 multiple choice and all of those um, FRQs involving a calculator. OK, all right, guys, so we'll pick up there tomorrow night. Have a good night. Uh, nice to see all of you guys in chat. Thanks for coming. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Baker. You're welcome. See ya. Mr. Baker.